you're going to need to unmute her. Yeah. There we go. Hello, everybody. My name is Mandy Bauer. I am the Assistant Director of Programs at ASC English in Boston, Massachusetts. Hi, everyone. I'm Daryl Bish. I'm the Assistant Director at the University of Florida at the English Language Institute. And I mentioned my name is Cheryl Delk Legood, and I'm the Executive Director for English USA, the association of 240 programs. Hey everybody, I'm Ken Janjigan. I direct the English Language and Training Academy at American University, and I also serve as the academic director of our Pathway program. Hi, I'm Lisa Kraft. I'm the director of International Special Programs at Pace University in New York. And we hope that Jennifer can join us later. We'll see. Um, my name is Heather Snavely, and I am the director of the Intensive English Program at California Baptist University in Riverside, California. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. This is Thomas Tyner, and I am the uh, executive director of international programs at Cal State East Bay, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area. Hi, I'm Haviva Parnes. I'm the U.S. Head of Operations for EC English Language Centers. We have got schools in Massachusetts, New York, and California. Thank you, everyone. So we're going to start at the beginning. Why the United States? Okay, Thomas, take it away. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to say first of all, is we would love to have you study English in the United States. So we have a, a, a large selection of our industry here on this call, and everyone's excited to have you join our program. So I want you to know that. And one of the great things about studying in the United States is the reputation of higher education and English programs throughout the country. We have the most options for English programs uh, available in, compared to any country in the world. So you can find programs that are really small and really rural parts of the United States. You can find tons of programs in medium-sized cities. Uh, you can find programs in the, every major city in the, in the country. So one of the great things about studying also is your ability to network and make connections with other students here in the United States and from other countries. So that's one of the things our students often tell us, you will be in the classroom here with students from other parts of, of, of the Americas, also from Europe, from Asia, you name it, you'll find a mix of students from all around the world. And that actually is one of the great things about studying in the United States. There's great cultural diversity that you'll find in many parts of the, of the country. And Granted, you get a lot of that in big cities, but you also will be surprised in medium, medium sized cities, you'll find many different types of uh, communities and, you know, diversity that you'll be able to enjoy. The other great thing, I study abroad in another country myself, and one of the things I can tell you that we are really good about in the United States is the support we provide for our students. And you will have a whole team here that will guide you through uh, how to apply. And once you he are here, we are very good at making sure you're not bored and have outside activities in addition to your, your um, academic studies. And the other good thing is you're not so far away. If you're in Central South America, we have many flights. So it's very easy to travel here compared to some parts in Europe and, and, and you know, and other parts of the world. Also, another great thing, is the flexibility. So you'll find programs that will last a very short time, or you'll find programs that will, you can spend a, you know, a year or more to, to practice your English or study English. And finally, I have to say, um, once you're here, we pretty much in our industry and in English language teaching, we really know that it's more than just the classroom. So you'll find your 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 community and your interests oftentimes it could be sports it could be hobbies you know or it could be arts so you'll be able to find out as you study here in the united states thank you thomas 
So let's talk about types of programs, but just one second. We will be opening the chat later so that you can answer, uh, ask questions, okay? So hang on, we're gonna answer most of them, but we'll open it in a little bit. Great. How about um, Ken and Lisa? Sure. So Lisa, am I going first? Yeah, go first, it seems. Yeah, like so I'm gonna talk about uh, one type of program. So English for academic purposes, um, like the name states, this is studying English with academic goals. And I'm going to focus on um, pathway programs. So commonly students with this goal will apply for a pathway program. If their goals are academic, um, a pathway is a really, really common way to approach this plan. And so what is, what is a pathway program? This is a conditional admission program. It's for students whose English proficiency falls just below or even further below the required minimum score for a university or program um, in reference to the TOEFL or IELTS English proficiency exam. So if the, the requirement is perhaps an 85 on the TOEFL and a student scores a 75, that is where a pathway program can become a possibility. Um, there are options for both undergraduate and graduate programs, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, in the pathway program, you'll take English language courses mixed with credit bearing courses, such as math, economics, business, uh, other university type courses. We mentioned a few here, pre-LLM, pre-engineering, nursing, MBA. So pathway programs can lead to uh, one of these types of programs and many, many others. Um, uh, like I said, in the, in the pathway, you will mix English language classes with credit bearing courses that will eventually count towards your degree. Um, these programs, they can be shorter term or longer term. So they generally last for one to five semesters. Therefore, we're talking about you know three to four months at a minimum usually to about a year, a year and a half on the longer end. And many pathway programs allow students to start at the intensive English language level. So you can start with taking courses in all English, and then move your way up into the pathway where you start mixing courses. If you successfully complete the pathway, um, which is often based on your grades in the courses, then you will become a full-time student at the university. And like I said, there are many, many options, many different majors. There's usually a pathway program um, available for any type of study that you want. So now I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Lisa, who's gonna talk about English for specific purposes. Thanks, Ken. Um, so English for Specific Purposes is commonly known as English Plus something. Um, and these courses are typically a little more fun, <laughs> can be a little more fun, um, as you can see from this uh, not very exhaustive list uh, where there's so many choices. Um, this is just a sample. Um, that of, of types of courses. So in filmmaking, business, surfing, um, Disney, cooking, and golf, um, these are these types of courses can exist in any length at any length of time. So it could be a one week course, it could be a two week. Commonly, you'll find them probably between two and four weeks long. Um, and they could be at any time of year. So uh, in the summer, we our programs uh, have these courses running throughout from June to August. Um, but for a lot of South Americans, you may want to come up in January. So there are also possibilities you would find some of these courses um, offered in the January term. Um, and um, a lot of the programs have partnerships with outside organizations. So, for example, you might find an English plus dance. Um, so it's the our language school might do the English portion, but then you might go to another institution to do a dance program. And those two organizations work together to create a program for you. Um, and another kind of not so fun program might be an English plus test prep. 
So test preparation for TOEFL or IELTS um, or a college readiness program where you come and learn about, you know, what, what is the best fit of a university for you or your what kind of programs are you looking to take or to go to college for? Um, so there's all those, that's another type of program. Um, a lot of these programs also include experiential learning, which means you would, um, in addition to the classes, you would go out uh, to the community and maybe do something connected to English plus filmmaking. Maybe you're going out and meeting a director of a, of a famous director of a film, or you are um, going out and actually doing the filming and, and talking to Americans and, um, and then going back to, to the university and editing that and um, presenting that to a group at the university or language school. So, it's an opportunity for you to do more than just sit in a classroom. You're actually going out and doing something fun and interesting. So there's lots of different opportunities. I highly encourage you to go to um, our website, the English USA website and search for these types of programs. Um, you can, you might come up with a surprising list. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. And next, we have length and structure. Lots of diversity in the US. Mandy? Thank you, Cheryl. So for length and structure of our different types of programs, as you saw in the previous slide, there are so many different options that you can choose. And there's also a lot of options you can choose as far as how long you can stay or want to stay in the United States. There are some short-term programs that can range from one to two weeks to maybe two to three months, like for example, summer exchange programs. Those tend to be shorter. They tend to incorporate English language learning with a lot of other activities. Um, there are longer term programs, maybe three to 12 months long, such as intensive English programs and pathways programs. We also have degree programs, which depending on the type of degree you plan to get can be as short as one year and up to maybe seven years if you're going for your PhD. A couple things to consider with any of these programs is, do I need visa support? Um, Daryl will speak about visas in the next section, um, but you will need to consider that. If you are on a certain type of visa, there are certain programs that you must study with. Um, you need to ask, where do I want to study? There are so many options all over the United States. So you can pick your weather, you can pick your region, you can pick how close it is to other states for traveling purposes. Um, also, what are your goals? Are you only here to visit for a little while and maybe improve your English while you travel around? Or are you hoping to get a degree or a certificate of some kind? While you consider these, some of these programs have what we call rolling admission. Rolling admission means that they um, invite new students to begin classes fairly regularly, maybe every month or two. Um, but then there are also programs like the degree programs, um, like bachelor's, master's, and PhDs that do have specific um, deadlines for your applications. So pay attention to those deadlines, make sure that you can get your visa in time, make sure that you can get all of your documents in time if it's one of those more strict deadline uh, programs. And uh, level availability. Some programs require a specific level of English proficiency like those degree programs and others, you can start at beginner English and work your way up. So just ask yourself, what's my level? What's my current level? How long do I have to study and what are my goals? And that will help you narrow down programs you might be interested in. Thank you, Mandy. And next, this was probably one of the more popular choices of topics when we sent you 
a, um, a survey, but Habiba is going to talk about costs and fees. Thank you, Cheryl. Hi, everybody. I know this is a very popular topic, um, and we're going to talk about it today a little bit, but I do want to make sure that everyone knows this can vary wildly from program to program and place to place. So uh, we'll talk a bit about what you can expect, but know that you'll really need to dive a little deeper into the different programs that you're interested in once you've chosen your part of the country or decide how long you want to study or what kind of visa you want to take. You'll definitely want to do some investigation at that um, institution and see what their costs and fees may have in addition to some of the things listed here. Um, so we want to think about when you're thinking about costs and fees, you want to think about what's going to happen prior to arrival, what kind of money are you going to need uh, before you've even entered the United States, and then also uh, once you're here, what kinds of, you know, what kind of money will you need to be successful, be able to enjoy your program and, and live here comfortably. So the first step is really looking at the school's application fees. They may require a deposit. There might be a registration fee just for the application itself. Um, and you'll also have to pay some uh, student visa fees. So you'll keep in mind that you will need to do that for your appointment, you will need to pay that uh, visa fee. And, and Daryl's going to talk a little bit more about the specifics of what happens there in terms of a student visa and things like that. But the visa fees also, you may be, if you're coming for a short-term program and you're coming on a tourist visa, might be a little bit different. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind that those will vary and there will be a scale of that depending on kind of what side, what kind of program you end up choosing. You'll also want to think about housing, whether this is something you're doing on your own or if maybe uh, the program that you're entering requires you to have a certain kind of housing. And Heather's going to speak about that a little bit later. Um, but those housing costs can vary significantly depending on if you're living on campus, off campus, uh, if you're getting an apartment, if you want your own place, if you want to share a place, uh, if you're coming with friends. So there's there's a lot to consider, but it can be a significant cost. It also depends on where you're going and what that city is like. Um, there's also obviously the tuition for the program. So if you're going for a program that's short and quick, it might be a bit cheaper um, than if you're going for something a bit longer and need to put in a few more uh, weeks or a year in order to bring your English level up. Um, there's also often a materials cost. Sometimes this materials cost is rolled into the admission, into the tuition, excuse me. So you might not see this itemized separately, but some schools will require you to purchase your materials and books separately. Um, and those can add up as well. So you'll want to take a look and make sure that that's outlined for you from your institution. You want to think about transportation. Uh, even if you're living on a campus, you're going to want to go out into the city. You may want to take Ubers places. So is there transportation within the city? Do you have buses and subways in access? Or are you going to need to spend money on taxis and Ubers? Do you have a driver's license? Are you going to want a car? Uh, are you going to be somewhere a little bit more remote where having a car and being able to travel around might be something that you're super interested in? So kind of keep that in mind. Um, and you're also going to want to have a phone here in the US. Uh, does your phone work in the US? Uh, do you need a, a new SIM card? What's your international calling plan? Um, the US does tend to have some very different services <laughs> than abroad. And so we're often on a different network. So you do need to think about how you're going to be able to get in contact um, with your friends and family back home, because we know that's also very important to you, but also how you're going to be able to connect and contact uh, your new friends and family in the United States. We also want to think about, as Thomas mentioned, you know, we're really great with services here in the U.S. and providing a sort of concierge service uh, for your stay in the U.S. So it's not just about what happens in the classroom. It's also about what happens outside the classroom. So think about what kind of travel you're going to want to do. If you're choosing a spot, for example, on the East Coast, uh, Getting up and down the East Coast and accessing all accessing all kinds of cities is really easy. There's a lot of great trains and buses and transportation like that. And you're going to want to see um, Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia and New York and Miami. So you want to make sure that you have the money to have those that travel and access. If you're going to be somewhere more in the middle of the country, um, it might be 
bigger distances, you might have to talk about flights and travel that way. Are you going to spend your summer holiday, for example, uh, traveling around visiting the U.S. Uh, national parks? Well, that's going to that's going to be a different kind of activity and what that's going to cost you. So think about what kind of travel and activity you'd like to do. And then last but not least, um, the American healthcare system is a bit different than what most people are used to. And so you do want to make sure that you have health insurance or some kind of medical coverage when you're here. Some programs will recommend a health insurance for you and, and give you that at a special rate. Some programs have uh, health built into their campus, and so you have access to health facilities at the campus. Um, and other places, you will have to buy some travel insurance or travel medical care, and that will be a decision that you'll need to make with your institution about what's the right uh, travel or medical insurance for you. But it can be an added cost, and depending on the kind of coverage you have, what happens to you in the US could be expensive as well. So it's something to keep in mind. I uh, included on here a little link to a cost of living calculator. I really like this one. It allows you to compare not just cities in the United States, but also your own hometown or country to country as well. So you can kind of see what it's like and what it will cost you. Um, and it's really interesting to see it talking about average rents and food and going out restaurants, travel, all that kind of stuff is included in there. So I highly recommend when you're looking at your program and you're choosing where you want to be to get a sense of what that's going to look like for you cost wise. This is a great place to start. And last but not least, you know, there were plenty of questions about scholarships and work. Um, to be honest, there aren't a ton of programs that often scholars offer scholarships, but they do exist. I would absolutely recommend you check out the English USA resources page, which we're also, uh, a link has just popped into the chat, but we'll also share with you later as well. And this uh, resource will allow you to search, not just as Lisa and Ken were talking about programs specifically, but you can look up um, if a school offers a scholarship and what that means. So you'll need to speak with those schools directly about that. As far as work is concerned, this one does get a little bit tricky. Um, and really, only university programs are typically able to offer work opportunities. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, it does get a bit complicated, but there are options and it depends on your institution. It depends on your visa. So you'll just have to do some inquiry if that's something that's very important to you when you're talking to a program to find out what the opportunities that might be available for you. All right. Thank you, Haviva. I'm looking, I'll, I'll share a little definition of the term rabbit hole. I think I've used the, that word three or four times this week. So. Great. Our next uh, category is, um, is where it kind of all starts, um, the process, right? We're talking about all the prep now, the considerations, but now maybe you've decided where you want to go. So Daryl, can you take it away? Happy to. So you've done your homework. You've gone to the English USA website and you have identified a school that you would like to go to. Um, so the first step is to start the application process. Slide, please. I, or we cannot move to the slides. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. All right, so once you find a school that you want to be a student at, um, you have to do an application. Every school that you are interested in is going to require you to submit an application, and almost every school is going to ask you for your passport. Um, schools might also ask you to pay an application fee, like Haviva had talked about, or a tuition deposit. Depending on the program that you're going to, they might also ask for proof of high school completion. And if you're going to apply for an F1 student visa, you're going to have to show financial documents showing that you have the ability to support yourself while you're a student in the United States. And some programs will require you to take a placement test in advance, or they have some other requirements. Uh, but it, all of the programs will have this information on their website, and they'll also have the contact information. So if you have any questions about applying to an English language program, uh, you can always talk to the school directly. Next slide. So most students who come to the United States to study English, they come on the F1 student visa. 
this is what you need to enter the United States to study. And when you are accepted to a school after you've provided all of the application requirements, they create a Form I-20 for you. Uh, and you can see what the Form I-20 looks like right there. Uh, so the Form I-20 is a really important document. It has a lot of information that you need to know. It has the name of the school. It has how long you will study. It has the estimated costs uh, that you can expect to spend during your time at the school. Uh, so you need to have this I-20 in order to apply for the visa. Um, once you have the I-20, um, or even beforehand, you can schedule the visa interview at a U.S. embassy. Uh, you can go to the link that's on the slide, or you can do a search, uh, or you can go to the U.S. embassy website, and you can uh, fill out form DS-160. There is a $185 fee uh, for that form. Um, and then once you have the visa appointment and the I-20, you can also pay a $350 I-901 CBIS fee. Uh, this fee is from the United States government um, and you have to pay it before you go to the visa interview. Uh, the fee is connected to the I-20. And then also when you go to the embassy, you need to bring, of course, your passport. And uh, you may also need to bring financial or other supporting documents. So you got the I-20. Uh, you've scheduled the visa interview, you are ready to go to the embassy and talk to a consular official. So what happens next? So once you're at the embassy, um, most people, when they think about the visa interview, they imagine themselves talking to a person in this conversation and there's this exchange going on. In reality, it is a very short interview. It is three minutes. You may not even, you may only be asked one or two questions. Um, because the interview is so short, it is very important that you be prepared. Uh, you need to know your study plan and, and your purpose for being a student. You need to know the information on the I-20. You should be able to explain why you want to study English at ABC school, uh, how long you plan to study English at the school, and what you plan to do after you study English. Do you plan to return home or will you go on to a university or college after you study English? Um, it is really important that you're able to be prepared and tell your story to the a consular officer so they can make a decision about your case. It's also really important to have, uh, to demonstrate ties to your home country. Uh, so if you are, for example, a 40-year-old person who wants to come and study English for a short amount of time, you might want to have a letter from your employer saying why they want you to study English uh, with them. If you are fresh out of high school and you're, you want to go to university in the United States, um, it's really hard to show ties from home, but you can talk about your education plans and how you will return home after you graduate. What's probably most important is if you go to the embassy and they think that you are going to come to the United States and stay here, they will automatically deny the visa. You do not want to show immigrant intent. So when you are in the visa interview, you say, after I study, whatever you want to study, you will return home. Um, if you say, hey, I'm gonna go study because I also want to, my, my mom lives in America and I also want to go be with her. That's a red flag. Uh, you may not want to bring that up. Um, so it's really important to talk about your study plan and what you will do afterwards, which is return home. Uh, you'll see two links on the page. These are uh, good resources for tips for applying for the student visa. And of course, the, um, the Education USA advisors are an excellent resource, and we recommend that you meet with them before you go to the visa interview for advice. So many people want to study um, on the F-1 visa. Let's say congratulations, you get the visa. You, after you have the visa, you must report to the school that issued your I-20. So you can enter the United States 30 days before the school starts. After you enter, you have to report to the school uh, to be a student. On the F-1 student, you, as an F-1 student, you have to be a full-time student. What does that mean? Um, for some programs, it means 23 hours a week, 
for other programs, it's 18 hours a week. So you'll want to talk to your school to find out what full-time means for them. The government defines full-time as 18 hours a week or higher. And once you enter the United States as a student, you can stay in the United States on the F-1 visa as long as you are a student. So for example, you could enter on, to be a language training student to study English, then you can go get your undergraduate degree, then you can go to your master's and then get your PhD. You could be in the, in the United States for 10 years on the same visa, as long as you maintain your student status. Also, as an F-1 student, you can bring your, your family, you can bring your spouse or your, and your children, and then after you are arrived, you can transfer to a new, a new school. And as Haviva said, um, some schools, if you, specifically universities, you are able to have a job on campus, but you need to talk to the school to find out what's possible before you make a choice about a school and employment. And then finally, um, a lot of the programs we've talked about are these short-term programs, and maybe you don't need an F1 student visa to go to these programs. It is possible to study on the tourist visa. Um, if you do study on the tourist visa, you need to check with the English program to make sure that they allow it. If you are able to study on the tourist visa, uh, you'll be a part-time student. You're not able to be a full-time student because you're a tourist, you're not a student. And then uh, the, the study on a tourist visa is really ideal for the short-term study, the, the, two, the two weeks or two month program. Um, but some, if you already have a tourist visa in your passport and you only want to study for a short amount of time, this could be a great option for you. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Daryl. And our uh, last topic um, before we close uh, and open it up is about housings, I believe. Yes. <laughs> uh, Heather. I need to unmute myself first. So you have decided on your school and you have uh, decided you know, where you wanna live, you've gotten your visa, you need to start thinking about housing. And the type of housing that's available to you, there's so many different options, just like there's so many different programs. So it'll depend on your length of study and the options that your school offers. So you want to choose your housing options before you arrive okay make sure you investigate that you look into it before you arrive in the United States. So there are basically two types of housing you have on campus housing and off campus housing. On campus housing includes residence halls, so a residence hall can be traditional where you. Uh, you have a room with a bed and a desk, you might have a roommate, and then you have communal areas, which are areas that all of the people living on that floor or in the residence hall, they all can hang out together. It might be bathrooms, it might be lounges, you might have a communal kitchen. Um, there's also special residence halls. So a residence hall for freshmen, or maybe multicultural housing. Uh, you might have an international floor. Um, there's all different kinds of options when it comes to residence halls. You might also have on-campus apartments. And these apartments are on campus and you might have a um, kitchen, you might have a shared living area, you have roommates, you have a little bit more independence than residence halls, but you're still on campus. Okay. Maybe you want to choose to live off campus, or maybe your program only offers off campus housing. There are a lot of options for off campus housing. Maybe you're going to do homestay. So a homestay is where you live with a family. Uh, it's a great way to learn about American culture to practice your English. Some schools actually partner with homestay organizations. And so you can talk to your school to find out if they have a homestay program. You could also choose like an independent apartment. 
And this is where you find your own apartment, either living by yourself or with roommates. Now, if you choose this option, you will need to sign a lease and you'll have to pay utilities and things like that. If you wanna live with a roommate in an apartment, your school might have a list of people who are looking for roommates. Um, another option is school managed off campus shared apartments or houses. This is where the school owns the apartments and houses and you pay the school to live there. Um, and maybe you'll live with assigned roommates. You're still off campus though, so you have that independence. Another option is private rooms for rent. So you could rent a room in a house. Um, you want to check to see what you are allowed to use in the house. You know, maybe you just get a room or are you allowed to use the kitchen or the living room? Okay. Um, some schools will offer a list of rooms for rent. Just be careful that you check out the place for a room to rent first. Maybe you you go and check it out yourself or you find someone you maybe you know someone in the area and they can check because you just want to make sure that you know what you're moving into when it's a room for rent. Some things to consider. So what can you afford? You know, we've talked about the costs, you know, everybody has has a certain amount of money that they can pay different parts of the country cost more than other parts. So you want to look into that when it comes to housing. When you're considering a school, what can you afford? Okay. Um, how are you going to find the housing? Okay, so check with your school, see what housing they offer. You can check websites, social media. All of this is a good way to decide what you can afford. Okay. Next one is um, what amenities do you want? So amenities are, are things that um, help you in your life, like maybe something that's offered. So an amenity could be um, a pool or laundry service. Um, amenities on campus could be easy access to classes, the dining hall, the recreation center. So think about what do you want? What amenities do you want, okay? Um, another thing is, do you want to live with roommates or alone? So um, what kind of housing do you want? Do you want roommates or do you want to live alone? Um, do you want to meet as many people as possible? Do you want your privacy? You know, what, what are you looking for when it comes to who you're going to live with? Right? Um, do you have transportation? So if you don't have transportation, you want to, it's better to live on campus or near campus so that you can walk or ride a bike. Um, if you have transportation, you can live farther from campus. But always remember about commuting. So um, if you're in a big city, uh, like in California, traffic is crazy. So it might take longer for you to get to class. If you're on the East Coast, you might have public transportation that would be a little bit easier. But always consider that. Okay? And finally, again, what kind of housing do you prefer? Everyone has different preferences. So um, think about what do you want? Do you want to, again, meet people? If so, maybe you wanna live on campus. Do you want your privacy? Then maybe you're gonna to wanna to live off campus in your own apartment. Okay? Do you wanna learn more about culture? Maybe you wanna live with a family. So you have lots of things to think about when choosing housing. Just make sure you have housing set up before you come. Even if it's a local hotel until you can find an apartment, but always have something set up before you arrive. I've had students in the past who have arrived at the airport and they have nothing set up and it's really stressful. So make sure that you have something set up. Talk to your school. They have lots of options and they'll be able to help you as you search for housing. Thank you, uh, Heather. Now I'm trying to to bring uh, Claudia up up to the top here. <laughs> Can't figure out how to do it. Um, Claudia, can you turn your 
Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Give me one second to see if I can. Just one. Um, Let's see. And I'm actually going to make the chat available and I'm going to make a uh, video available as well. So for everyone right now, um, you should be able to put a question in the chat box if you'd like to do that. Okay. So I'm, I'm just so excited. Uh, we're going to do this last slide while everybody's putting their questions in the chat. And Claudia uh, is, is the Education USA advisor who, who asked us to do this. So we just feel so fortunate. Um, so Claudia, can you introduce yourself to the, to the, to the group? Thank you, Cheryl. So uh, my name is Claudia Carrillo and I am the advisor uh, in Santiago at the University of Mayor. And um, I am so happy that we had such a great number of people uh, attending and so honored that so many of you representatives have been able to present today. I love how you presented the topics. All the topics cover everything that I could think of students needed to know. And uh, I am so happy you could do this today for them and for us. Uh, I also wanted to, to thank definitely Cheryl for putting all this together and also uh, to uh, my country coordinator for promoting the the event and also my regional uh, coordinator who is Rita Morriconi that also uh, you know promoted this event among the offices. For all of you that do not know us, uh, we are Education USA, the program of the US government. And basically what we do in each country is advise students on how to apply to US universities at the intensive English level, at undergraduate level and uh, graduate programs as well. So I'm so happy again and so grateful for these presentations. Thank you very much. And I'm going to put every for everyone the link uh, to contact us and to find our offices and uh, the all the resources that we have on the website. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can definitely get in touch with us. Okay. Great. Thank you, Claudia. And yes, there is uh, some information there about Education USA. That's how you found out about this webinar. And then also, I just wanted to, to put this, this resource link up again. Um, on, this, on our student resources page is where you can do a search for a particular state or city uh, and find out which programs are in those states or cities. Um, it, you can't do it by regions yet, but um, you can at least uh, narrow down your search. There is also a function, and I saw this question in the chat, so hopefully I can answer this one now. Uh, there is a also, if you wanted to go to Illinois and you wanted to find out if there are any programs with scholarships, you can choose on, uh, you can click on scholarships and it'll give you programs that have scholarships. The inquiry form that you can see there, I'm, I'm, I, I'm hoping I'm looking at everybody with their phones right now, you know, filling out the inquiry form and uh, and what I will do following up um, any inquiries we get, I will send them to the uh, the states or the cities that you mentioned. So please, please use our resources. And, uh, and now I'm going to ask for some help because a lot of questions came through and um, where can we start? I mentioned the, um, the scholarship link. Cheryl, do you, would you like me to um, put the link of the inquiry form in the chat? Oh, that'd be great. Okay. I thought I was being, I thought I was being all, you know, hip by doing a QR code. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's just some people are looking at the phone. So yes. just case. Um, this might be a question for Daryl and Haviva. If I've started the process for a tourist visa, I have an appointment for next year. Will it be an issue to apply for a F-1 visa? Uh, no, you can have both pass both visas in your passport at the same time. Yeah, but you do need to make sure that you're entering the country. You can only hold one visa at a time. So you can have both in there, uh, but when you come into the country, you'll either come in on the tourist visa or you'll come in on the student visa, depending on what your purpose is for that particular trip. So it's it's yes, but also you have to be a bit cautious about which visa you're using when you enter the country. 
but it shouldn't impact the visa application process. No, definitely not. And for the for the presentation that we showed you, those slides, the answer is yes. We will be sending the presentation and the rec or the recording to to everybody that signed up. And we had about eleven hundred people sign up, so I promise we'll get that out to everybody. Where, if someone wants to help me with the next one, I know there's a lot about the tourists in the F one. Um, where can I apply for programs in New York? If you go to that to that inquiry form or to our website, you can look for New York um, or other cities also in the U.S. <laughs> there was a question about um, if someone has a working visa, are they able to study? Um, yes, if they're here on a... H, V, E, or O visa, they, they can take English classes while they're right. working. Um, not balancing the English classes while they're working <laughs> is another story, <laughs> but they can take the classes. There's a lot of questions about scholarships. Do we want to talk a little more about that? There, I mean, in my experience, there's not a lot of scholarships for intensive English study in the United States, um, uh, but there, there are ways to save costs, and that's by maybe studying as a tourist if you want a short-term program or uh, reduce the length of your study. Um, you can also, uh, if you do get the student visa, uh, you can find a program that um, fits your needs that might be in a, a lower, a less expensive part of the country, for example. Um, so you just have to do a little homework and find out what are the, the options available, what is your budget, and what is the area uh, of the country that might be the best fit for you for what you're looking for. And Daryl, I'm gonna go ahead. Can everybody see my screen here again? So, um, yes. yeah, so I just wanna show, uh, this is on our website under program search, okay? And I know this is weird, but you have to put the United States <laughs> first. <laughs> And let's say I wanted to go to um, to uh, let's say I wanted to go to Georgia, the state of Georgia. And then right here, I wonder if there are any scholarships for any programs in Georgia. So I do Georgia and I click yes, and then I hit the button and I'm holding my breath, <laughs> hoping. But, um, but then you'll see that there are two programs that say that they offer scholarships. It's not a lot. There are a lot more programs in Georgia, but this is how you, this is how you do the search. So really, if you wanted to leave this empty and just hit this button and say yes, then you would get a list of all the English USA programs that offer scholarships, and then you can contact them directly. I hope that helps. Also, Cheryl, I would like to add that a lot of English programs are less expensive than university based uh, university degree seeking programs. So if you need to study English first, you can normally find a more affordable option, even at programs at universities. And I'm seeing some other questions like help with the visa process. Um, this is that that site that I showed you. Sorry, I hate to be the working one. <laughs> I'll just pipe in there and say that if you already have an I-20 from an institution um, or from a previous study and you want to study again, you've already got that F-1 visa, pro visa already processed. These are great things to speak about with your school. And I know Thomas mentioned at the beginning that we're very service oriented here in the States and every institution will um, have some sort of process to help you. If, you've, if you're doing the F-1 visa process, you're working with a designated school official and they'll be able to help you and guide you through the process a bit, give you some advice um, and sort of assist in getting through the process and let you know what you're going to need. At the end of the day, a lot of, you know, the interview and that will all be, you know, your responsibility, but the institutions are always there to help you as a, as a DSO myself, and I know several other people on the call as DSOs, that's something that we, we do a lot uh, to help students get through the process. 
And I see another really good question that I wanted to bring up for in housing and the application, but I'm going to rely on my experts here about living with relatives while you're studying in the U.S. Um, I, when I was in Brazil speaking to a visa counselor office officer, you know, that's an, that could be an important part of an interview that you're going to stay with relatives while you study English. Is that correct? I mean, that's it's OK. It depends on the program, but like uh, what you can do is talk to the school and say, hey, I'm living with my family and they may not, they may be able to remove the estimated housing costs from the I-20. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's less money you have to show when you go to the embassy. Uh, but that's a, a question for a school because each school will have their specific policies for that. And also, to be honest, I don't know if I would go to the embassy and say, hey, I'm living with my family member, because then they might think you're trying to immigrate to the United States. Mm -hmm. OK, I'm just scanning the questions. I think uh, we all are. Just There's just... questions about minors. Is there, there's, there any programs for? students under 18? It's um, a great, mm -hmm. great question. And um, I, we probably should have prefaced that uh, that English USA, you know, are mostly post-secondary programs. But once again, find a program. You can pick a state. I'm not going to. Okay. You can also go to a map that if you want to look at a map. But youth programs, minors, youth, juniors it's a lot there are a lot of terms that are used so if you want to find out if one of our members has youth programs click on yes hit the button and this is going to show you all the youth programs in the united states okay there's a lot 88 all right you really want to consider where you want to study right and in this case the parents want to consider where you want to study too All right. I think you all were hitting the seven o'clock hour uh, or uh, Eastern anyway, the top of the hour. So I think we're gonna bring it to a close. I'm excited already to see about 20 student inquiries in my inbox, which I will get to in the morning. But uh, I just wanna thank Claudia again. I think there may have been a few other advisors on the call as, as well. Um, we will save these questions that are in the chat and I'll share them with the presenters. But uh, one day we really would like to, to see you come to the US and, uh, and if you have any other questions, please fill out that, that inquiry form. Thank you speakers also. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Cheryl, Heather, Haviva, Daryl, Mandy, Lisa, Ken, Thomas. This has been fantastic. It's been, a real, been an honor and uh, hope to keep in touch. We have fairs going on, if you can come in person as well. So I, I took the opportunity to let you know. And uh, we're always available. Just let us know. And uh, it was a pleasure. So I hope you have a great rest of the week. And thanks again. Right. Take care. Thank you. Bye.